Welcome to this lecture review. Here we're looking at the Guide to Computer Forensics and Investigation. We are looking at the fifth edition, chapter 13, Cloud Forensics. So do keep in mind, just like the other chapter, this is just a brief overview of forensics in the cloud. Our objectives are to describe the main concepts, look at some of the legal challenges, give an overview of the technical challenges because of cloud issues, how to acquire data, uh, how to conduct a basic investigation in the cloud, and explain what remote access tools can be used for cloud investigation. So an overview is cloud was introduced as a way of managing data that we didn't really have five, seven, eight years ago. And what we define as a cloud really is just storage on the internet or storage on a network that may not be physically located here. So in reality, the cloud concept we've had for quite a while. We just started leveraging it a lot better. New standards are being developed to improve security practices and incident response because of cloud environments. Uh, but there's still a lot that is missing. The idea of cloud computing came uh, from several people. Again, I'm not going to argue this. Um, Salesforce developed a web service that applied digital marketing to business subscribers. That was one type of uh, cloud service. Amazon created the Amazon this. But ag again, what we think of cloud, we're thinking more of the uh, after Web 2, which is the Google Apps, the iCloud, the OneDrive, the Google Docs, um, things like that. Those were more public clouds or private clouds that we got on board with. The issue was there was still a lot of cloud services out there without really any service level uh, agreements. So NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, came up with a definition, uh, a computing storage system that provides an on-demand network access to multiple users and allocated storage to users to keep uh, up with the changing uh, times. That's what they define a cloud as, or cloud computing as. Now that led us to three different services or service levels when we talk about cloud. Things like software as a service, platform as a service, or infrastructure as a service. SaaS is applications that are delivered via the internet. Platform as a service could be an operating system such as Linux or Windows that is installed on a cloud server that you have access to on the fly. Same thing with infrastructure as a service. It's infrastructure that you can pay as you go. Again, SAS, PASS, AS, A I A A S, information as a service, platform as a service. You can get most things now as a service. You can now get disaster recovery as a service as well. So I kind of already brought up the concept of private versus public. Public is accessible to anyone on the internet that can be shared. Private can be accessed only by those authorized. There's also a hybrid, which is a combination of the two, and a community. And a community is more of a way to bring things together for a specific purpose. There are numerous cloud providers. Pretty much any large IT company now also has a cloud version. So cloud forensics is, considering a set, is considered a subset of network forensics because it's going to be more based off the internet. Cloud forensics can have three major dimensions, organization, legal, and technical. Forensics tools capable uh, needed to handle this for acquiring data. Again, data collection, elastic static and live forensics, evidence uh, segregation, investigation in virtual environments. Because again, most of what we're doing is going to be off of online servers. So things like uh, live 
and uh, elastic and investigations with VMs, that's where most of that data is going to come from. When investigating a cloud service, consider factors involving the relationship with your cloud provider. This section explains kind of how the CSP contracts obligations with cloud users and how warrant subpoenas can be applied. So part of that deals with our service level agreements, our SLAs, and that's the contract between our cloud provider and the customer. They describe pretty much what level of service they're going to be getting. Support options, penalties, performance, fees, and any of the required software and hardware that may be well, required or needed. SLAs define the scope, things like service hours, availability, restrictions, responsibilities, throughput. If there's contingency plans, if there's a business continuity or disaster recovery plan. SLAs define, again, fees, security measures, and what I would do like here is terminology so that there is commonality between both the provider and customer, making sure that everyone is on the same page. The cloud provider's components must state who is authorized and what limitations are there to uh, conduct investigations or to acquire data. Follow, uh, part of that deals with the policies and standards and procedures for those cloud providers. Things like digital forensics that should re uh, review those policies. Again, we're not going to talk about what a policy is, standards or guidelines, but I mean, there's a pretty straightforward guidelines or the best practices. Standards give the guidance. But those are things that you want to look into when you're looking at cloud providers. This is something that most people have not bothered to do. Most organizations that I've worked with have not looked into their cloud providers investigation portion at all. And this is becoming a, a huge area of concern because when you have to meet federal guidelines and who has access to my data, these questions start popping up. So cloud providers and access to protected data or protected information and how much access do they have versus how much access should they have. The nice thing is part of these policies also define things like the workflow, uh, including hardware configuration, what you're renting, the efficiency, things like that. Typically with jurisdiction issues, if there's no plans to revise current laws. So with that, there are many cross-jurisdiction legal issues that haven't really been resolved. No laws ensure uniform access to the required handling of the data in the cloud. So investigators should be concerned with cases involving data mingled with customer data. A big part of this is where is the data located? Where did the breach happen? Uh, is it within the U.S.? Is it outside the U.S.? What data laws are there? So how is privacy rights defined in different jurisdictions is one of those major issues. Because in some areas, you may be able to acquire data. In some areas, you may not. For example, the EU Directive 9546EC is way more restrictive than the U.S., this is about protecting private information for EU, or the European Union. So digital forensic examiners could be held liable when conducting an investigation involving cloud data if that cloud data occurred in the EU. Because again, if the server is in the EU, that data is subject to EU law. So again, understanding physical location of where that data is stored is becoming more and more critical. If there's a data center in India and it's for Sony PlayStation and there's a data breach, even though Sony is located in several locations, the data was physically located in this example in India, thus they must follow India law. But how does that affect 
if there is a data breach, U.S. law about notification. Because the data breach didn't happen within the U.S., so are they obligated to follow U.S. law when it comes to data breach for an issue or, or an incident that did not happen within the United States? That's one of those questions that keeps popping up. We also have the Electronic Communication Privacy Act, the ECPA, which does describe five mechanisms or five controls that governments can use to help protect the electronic information from a provider. Things like search warrants, subpoenas, court orders. A search warrant can be used only in criminal cases and must be requested via law enforcement. The law requires search warrants to contain specific descriptions of what information is going to be seized. For cloud environments, uh, property to be seized usually describes the data rather than physical hardware unless the provider or the cloud provider sus uh, is a suspect. Must also describe the location of the item to be seized. This is becoming increasingly difficult because of, again, cloud services. And they must establish how it will be carried out. Again, even more difficult because of location of the event, countries, dates and times to kind of mitigate uh, seizure uh, effects on or disruptions of an organization. Subpoenas and court orders. Typically here you're dealing with government agency subpoenas. This is normally a customer uh, communication and record that can't be uh, knowingly divulged to any person or entity. This is used to get information when it's believed there is a danger or serious physical injury or possibility thereof. There are non-government subpoenas, and this is used to produce information from private parties for litigation. Court orders are written by a judge to compel someone to, uh, to do something or not to do something. So there are different types of documents that may require an individual to divulge information. So let's go ahead and let's talk about some technical challenges. Things like the architecture, the data collection, the, action, the analysis, the acquisition of the data, uh, legal issues. Are there any type of anti-forensics employed in the analysis of cloud forensics data? Uh, the sheer mass amount of data. So, architect. There are no cloud providers that do things identical. So, each cloud provider does keep data stored location secret for security reasons. And that's understandable. But the differences in records, procedures, or logs keep making it more and more difficult for the investigation. If we're talking about the analysis, analyzing digital evidence from a cloud does require varying the data with the other data and log records or verifying. Again, mass amounts of data here, so it starts getting more and more complex. Examining logs so that we can review things like uh, a MAC address and dates and modification and things like that. These are all areas where we're provider, we're pretty much trusting cloud providers to give us more accurate information. We're trusting that our cloud providers have things like accurate dates, accurate times. That's not always the case. Anti-forensics that may destroy information that uh, could be potential evidence. Very common when it, we're dealing with hackers or malware. Uh, this could also just be as simple as inserting malware that encrypts everything. Other techniques that affect uh, is metadata by changing or modifying access time. Again, we're assuming that our cloud providers are keeping a good solid record, but that may or may not really be the case. Personnel trained to respond to these incidences. This is actually an area where we're really lacking. There is no internal first response team for a lot of cloud providers because most of the customers aren't requiring it. 
operational staff that will be cooperative to uh, investigations. Again, that may or may not happen. Uh, do you have to brief staff about operational security? Again, may or may not happen. Need to train staff in evidence collection if we're dealing with cloud providers. Again, that may or may not happen. And more often than not, a lot of the cloud providers, unless it's built into their contract, they're not doing it. Amazon, Microsoft, they have huge federal contracts. So yeah, in those regards, that's being protected. Role management and defined roles is becoming more critical. Data owner, data user. Uh, identity protection, that's again, if we're dealing within the United States, all of that's protected. User access and access controls based off of what requirements are needed for each of the individual users. For example, if, we, if you have Office 365, you may have an internal user structure who has uh, administrative rights, who doesn't. But on top of that, we have who on Microsoft's side can view act or have access to your email system. Part of this challenge is, as an investigator, you may have to collect information so you can identify additional victims and or suspects when dealing with cloud providers. There is an effort to standardize the cloud architecture, so that's a huge plus. Part of the Cloud Security Alliance has developed certain resources so that we can have better standards and training. Cloud investigation should have an understanding of the cloud architecture. Sources of these cloud forensics training are things like InfoSec Security. Uh, ISC does have a certified forensics professional. Uh, SANS has one, NIST has one, and there are other, are other schools that actually do provide cyber uh, crime investigations. So let's talk about acquisition. That's always a fun one, is how do we acquire data when we're dealing with cloud devices? Methods used to collect evidence in cloud investigations depend on the nature of the individual case. Recovering deleted data from cloud storage might be limited to the type of file systems that the cloud provider has. With cloud systems running on VMs, snapshots of those VMs can uh, yield valuable information, assuming that the cloud provider actually keeps documentation or backups of that information. Forensics examiners should recreate separate cloud servers from snapshots, if feasible, if possible, so that they can acquire images from them. Again, that may or may not even be possible, depending on the cloud provider you're working with. Moving on is encryption. More and more cloud providers and third parties offer encryption services so that cloud user data is kept securely. Some cloud providers have the ability to decrypt the data, some don't. So encryption is starting to play a huge role in data protection. Encrypted data in the cloud is in two major states, data at rest or data in motion. So the data at rest is gonna be more at the disk level, the storage level. Data in motion is gonna be data as it transverses or is transmitted over the network. Some even go as far as encrypting the data that will be running in memory. Thus, unless you're able to capture the actual server running everything and you have a way to decrypt it, you're not gonna be able to actually acquire data from it. Again, there are vendors that offer encryption services for cloud data. Uh, Secure Cloud, Fortran Micro, Safeguard are some of them. Uh, there is also what's called a homomorphic encryption, which that's a, a newer method, but it's still under development and probably will be seen more uh, mainstream in 2018, 2019 for better encryption on the uh, fly. 
So when investigating cloud incidences, again, you use a systematic approach at, like we outlined in chapter one. We have to be able to understand the type of incident that we're looking at. And we may have to follow guidelines from other areas because cloud is going to be more focused on internet or network-based forensics. Methodology may change. When you're dealing with investigating a cloud provider, there has no team or no limited staff. Investigators should ask uh, some questions. Does the investigator have the authority to use the cloud staff and resources to conduct the investigation? Does the cloud provider actually have a service level agreement in place that controls the flow of data and or allows outside investigators access to that data? Are there any restrictions? Is there a documented structure or topology to where data is located, how data is accessed, things of that nature? Investigators should ask, uh, are, is there a standard or procedures for e-discovery for that cloud provider? Is the data of interest to the investigation local or remote? In what country is that data located? winding this all up is you might find cloud related evidence in a web browser cached file system that you may or may not be able to legally access. What do you do? Some of this may actually be cached files on the end user's side. So some of that prefetched files are going to be files that have been cached on a local suspect's computer that you're able to look at. Here's a hex view of it. So examining the stored cloud data on a PC, for example, Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, they actually set up storage on a local PC. That way you actually are accessing that local copy and that local copy then is syncing the data over. Uh, Dropbox is a heavily used. WebEx is also very heavily used. Email, chat, all of this will leave cached files on a suspect's computer. Gmail, uh, if you have Google Drive, it actually has a drive cache location. Uh, application data is going to be more in app data. If we're dealing with Google Drive, again, there are sync database files, log files that you may or may not have access to. With OneDrive or SkyDrive, OneDrive, now is it called, again, it logs and synchronizes everything, but it keeps a local copy in uh, app data. There are prefetched artifacts, both that, uh, in Windows, on Mac, and Linux, that you can actually uh, acquire data. If we're looking at some of the prefetch artifacts, there's actually a lab on page four, uh, 499 in our lab book that you can use to review. We are going to be doing those videos at a later time. It's just right now that was not the immediate need for it. So that's coming. Few tools are designed for cloud forensics, but there are some tools that are available. Guidance software, access data, both have uh, some type of e-discovery that's made for forensics. There are some open uh, source ones like uh, Frost. This adds the forensics response, uh, response capabilities for a cloud provider. Features of uh, Frost. Frost are being able to bypass hypervisors. S uh, special malware can take control of the VM sessions. So there is there. We also it's called F response for the cloud. And again, that's another type of response. And that is the end of this chapter. Understand that cloud providers have unique challenges because of their structure. And because they are cloud, they are more global and understanding how that global investigation and the laws that are affecting them come into play. 
understand things like the SLA, uh, anti forensics tools, uh, incident response handling for cloud providers, how to acquire data or how to acquire evidence. And lastly, is again, how do we actually provide that systematic approach to our investigation? And so, again, this is just a dumbed down version, a simple version of cloud forensics. A nice brief overview. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.